doubt that many in the West Bank feel frustrated and downtrodden by the lack of progress in resolving their conflict with the Israelis and improving their living conditions. But, my Lords, the reasons for their parlous position lies at least as much with their own leaders as with the Israelis. And those poor Palestinians in Gaza are in hock to a Hamas that flatly refuses to have anything to do with an Israel that they constantly vow to destroy. Let me come first to the treatment of the young in custody that the noble Lord, Lord Warner, mentioned. It's hard not to believe that the reason that they find themselves in custody lies with the constant incitement coming from above. When Mr Abbas and the PLO spread malicious rumours that Israel is intent on taking over the Dome of the Rock and building a synagogue there, and when they put out the message that Mr Abbas did recently, that Israel is poisoning the water supply to the West Bank. It's not a surprise that his people are outraged, even though these rumours are soon found to be complete fabrications, just too late to stop the smoke without the fire. And when terrorists are extolled as true martyrs to the cause by the naming of Palestinian schools and public squares in their honour, and their families are given funding and compensation thereafter, what message does that give to the young? The official Palestinian media and educational system continually inculcate young minds with hatred and violence, so it's not much wonder that many of the recent attacks against Israelis were committed by youngsters. How else can you explain why 17-year-old Mohammed Tariya should take it upon himself to murder 13-year-old Halil Ariel asleep in her bed? after which his family were rewarded with funding by the PLO. Or why a 16-year-old should stab to death Eden Attias asleep on a bus. Or why five members of the Fogel family, including a 4-year-old and an 11-year-old, were killed by 17-year-old Hakim Ahmad. These are not the harmless children that the noble, Lord, noble lady Baroness Tong describes. Little wonder that Israel made arrests of some 600 underage teenagers last year although that number has to be compared with the one and a half thousand underage arrests by the Palestinians in the West Bank. Of course, there is no excuse for maltreatment by the Israeli military court, and the Israeli human rights organisation Military Court Watch keeps its beady eye on them. But it is worth noting that the courts have recently instituted reforms that ensure that captives are interviewed in Arabic, that they have access to a lawyer, and that their families are fully informed. I just mentioned that, uh, that that contrasts with the treatment of youngsters arrested by the Palestinians, where accusations of abuse and beatings are not uncommon. Much has been made of the water supply and sewage disposal. But why then did Hamas pre prevent UNICEF installing a desalination plant in Gaza when they realised that the equipment and expertise was coming from Israel? And why has the Palestinian Authority boycotted the Joint Water Committee set up with Israel to find solutions to the water supply to the West Bank? And why did they turn down an Israeli offer of a German-funded plan to improve the water supply to East Jerusalem? <clears throat> we should think carefully before casting all the blame Israel's way. Of course, indoctrination of hatred doesn't affect everyone. Thousands of Palestinians go across to work in Israel every day, and there should be many more if Israelis felt safer. And go to any Israeli hospital, as the noble Lord of Palak has said, you will see large numbers of children from Gaza and the West Bank being treated. Of the 2,000 or so Gazans coming through the Eretz crossing every day from Gaza, many are coming across for medical care. And when they're refused, it usually is Hamas, I'm afraid, that stops them. And the health of Palestinians, including children, is, in fact, somewhat better than in many other Middle East countries. Life expectancy, infant mortality rates, measures of nutritional status are at least as good amongst the Palestinians as they are in Jordan, Egypt or Saudi Arabia. And almost 50% of Palestinian children enter tertiary education. So, while there are all sorts of restrictions on life for the Palestinians, and the problems with the health of their children cannot be underestimated, it is not their major problem. It's the underlying sense amongst Palestinians that Israel's settlement policy is denying them a state of their own. 
leaving aside the question of rights of return of refugees. And on the other side, the feeling amongst Israelis is that the Palestinians have never really accepted their existence and want to drive them into the sea. The intense hatred, fed from ignorance and misconceptions of the other, is not helped when most Palestinians have only ever seen an Israeli as a soldier in full battle clear gear. And few Israelis know any Palestinians other than terrorists. They just don't know anyone on the other side who might be as anxious as they are for peace. And here I very much resonate to what the noble Lord Lord Judd has said about this. So we in the UK need to look at where we can make the most difference. We should be persuading Mr Abbas that if he's really serious about improving the lot of his young, he should put a stop to the PLO's incessant incitement to violence that his media and educational system is churning out. Instead, we should be encouraging and supporting the many organisations that are promoting better understanding. There are lots of them. The Camry Theatre is bringing Arab and Jewish speaking actors together to play Shakespeare in this centenary year, 400 centenary year. There are Arab Jewish schools, the Arava Institute in the Negev, where half the students are Palestinian and half are Israeli. And I should talk about a little charity that my wife and I set up that brings Israeli and Palestinian young uh, Israeli and Palestinian people to come to the UK to undertake medical research here and uh, that's going quite well. So these are the sorts of bridges that we should be building on. They're going to be needed if we are to get, ever to get out of the turmoil. And can I ask the noble lord, noble lady, the, the, the minister, if she will send a strong message to Mr Abbas to encourage him to take advantage of President Sisi of Egypt's her offer <coughs> excuse me, to host a resumption of negotiations with Mr Netanyahu. Abbas may feel that he can't put much trust in Mr Netanyahu, and I for one can well understand that. But whatever you think of him, he has been saying for some time that he is willing to meet Abbas at any time and anywhere without preconditions. Now you may not have wanted to believe him, but now Abbas could at least try to call his bluff since President Sisi has agreed to host both of them. Only by direct negotiation will they be able to resolve all the key issues that have eluded both parties for too long. Only by talking to each other is there any hope of a resolution and doing anything for the children in the Middle East. And we, must, we in the UK must do all we can to encourage that end.